Obey me. Okay. Sound. Ah. <laughs> well. Well. <laughs> and do it again. Yes, my lord. Good. So what we we know that there are a lot of things possible, genetic modification. But what is possible within our lifetime? That's what we want to know. So okay. So imagine genetic modification, like like me, like like growing the titanium tail, like from the titanium mine from the asteroid, and like climbing climbing the moon. Like, like yes. That. So many things. Yes. No, 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 don't show it on me. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's continue. Don't mind that. Don't worry about it. Okay. So let's continue. Uh, what we're trying to show is that before, like a stone age, what we thought, uh, what imagine people had imagination, it wasn't possible, right? They could not do. They imagine like fairy tales and everything, but they could not implement it. And throughout the time when we reached 2015, if you can think about it like um, traveling to the future, like doing anything. It is actually possible. It is actually possible. So we reach the point in time where the imagination, the compatibility of doing it, is actually the same. So did you notice anything unusual? Anybody notice anything unusual? For example, Anna was carried out. Yes. And we're gonna get there in a bit. Oh, yes, I know in San Francisco it's usual, but yes, honestly, it is unusual. Can I get the end of that? So, now let's, uh, let me ask some questions and, and I will talk to you guys. So, did you pay attention? So, first of all, what the attackers were wearing? Anybody remember something special about any attackers? Uh, let's say, yeah. Uh, so, I. I saw that um, all six kidnappers were wearing jeans. Jeans. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's interesting. Anybody else notice what they were wearing? Um, let's say in the first one. One of them was wearing a tiara, and one of them, and these two others were wearing gorilla gloves. <laughs> interesting. Oh, so people are really paying attention. Anybody else remember anything about what they were wearing? Uh, first row, try first row. And, and, and it's not gonna go that far. Just, I mean, you can go only first or second row, or people have to come here. Um, I think there was one with green pants, okay. green pants, cat scarf, and was one girl and five guys. Interesting. Okay. Um, how about and again first row? Um, try, try. I mean, he's popping his hand forever. Um, so. Yes, yeah, so there's definitely six of them, and one of them did have a cat scarf. Cat scarf. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, so let's see. So some like people say six, some five, maybe. So anybody thinks there were seven attackers? Anybody thinks seven attackers? No. Over there, somewhere. Seven attackers. Good. So let me ask a question. How many attackers actually were there? Um, Can anybody um, again try? Okay, so it's either for second row or you have to come close. Try him. I mean, it's just our phone uh, microphone. So there's one girl there wearing glasses, there were three guys wearing jeans, one other guy is wearing a scarf, and another guy is wearing a pair of weird So how many total? Six. 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 Okay. Anybody thinks it's other number than six? Uh, yeah, you have to come closer. Okay, you think? Can you come close to the microphone? Why? Four. Four attackers. Everybody thinks eight attackers. You five. cannot say four. Five, right? You also say four, okay? It's um, not six. You six. say six. It's not six because you're saying six to us. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> anybody? Okay. Just ask around the person how, how like how many attackers there were. Um, anyway. Pick around the person. Five. Five. Okay. Uh, six. So we have mostly six. There's some fives. We have some fours. Seven. Anybody seven? Oh, yeah. We have one seven. Okay, so mostly people think six, some fives, and mostly seven. The girl, was the girl wearing glasses or not? Anybody? Uh, can you come closer, please? Because like the mic I think there were six 
and the girl was definitely not wearing glasses. The girl not wearing glasses, okay, um, and six. Let's you know that there is a one girl. more person <laughs> saying like girl glasses or no glasses. One more person, maybe like one more, and then we'll move on. Pick another person. Can we also get a show of hands for how many people? You know, I don't know how many. You know, how many people there were. No, you have to say something. <laughs> <laughs> this is the whole point. You have to say something. Okay. Girl, wearing glasses, not wearing glasses. How many? Not wearing glasses. Not wearing glasses. Okay. So now let me tell you, and if you can come back, and I'll make it. Not so that much. Okay, so now let me tell you the point of the experiment. Um, should we invite them? I think so. Yeah, think let's invite the guys and you will see. Actually, we're gonna count them and we're gonna see what they were wearing. And we're gonna see what the girl was wearing. Was wearing. Hold on, we're gonna see just. So, Tuckers, <laughs> let's give a big round of applause to our Tuckers. And the girl. So, let's start with the girl. The girl just was sitting there and just answered a question about herself. So nobody knows it's that. Were you wearing? And she took, took off her glasses. So she was actually wearing glasses and now she took it off, ran all the way over there and sat over there and just answered the question about herself. Nobody noticed that. That's not the point. So the point of the... <laughs> that was the icing on the cake. So the point of the experiment was to show that some people, some of us, influence others. So when we have a crowd, we actually influence by other people's decisions. We have spies. Our spies, so raise your hands, spies. We have four spies. So they were answering questions first, and they, as somebody noticed, forced you to think there were six attackers, because in fact there was five of them. So, because they were first, and they kind of firmly said what they think, most of the other answers were also six. This is kind of how, it's, it has nothing to do with Adam's presentation, but <laughs> <laughs> this is one of, don't, don't, don't open that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is one of the uh, demonstrations of how we influenced by other people's thinking, right? But the main... So what's your point, that like, you can influence people to trick people? No, so the point, the point, of, this is actually a very famous experiment. Uh, the, exper the documentary was that experiment was actually banned because the point, the main point of the experiment, this is exactly how media works. When you see news, when you see news on TV, when you read news, this is exactly how it works. First person sees something happening. That person already influences the information which is gonna be passed. Then you have a news anchor person who writes the story. That person influences how you see it. Like let's say Reuters will write it. Then another, another, another. By the time news travels to you, you are influenced by somebody else. So it is very easy to kind of manipulate people. As we demonstrated, and if you wanna see the documentary online, that's even worse. I mean, just like first people just say what they are, and like almost everybody were saying like, like six or something like that. So some of you guys really paid attention. Some of you said four, I don't know why. <laughs> some of you said seven. But again, most of the people said uh, six. Some of you said five, so somebody did pay attention. But again, mostly the numbers were influenced by other people. Okay, so thank you to our Okay. Uh, the thing I like to do before I introduce our future speaker is I like to show this. Who knows who the guy? Oh, oh man, I forgot who the guy in the um, But who the guy in the left is? Oh yeah, yeah, I remember. Who knows who the guy in the left is? You know? Really? Okay. Who is he? Is it the guy who discovered penicillin? No, that was a trick question last time, but this is a different guy. <laughs> but good to remember that. So I had that slide last time, and there was a different guy, and that guy discovered penicillin. But it's totally different guy. <laughs> so, uh, if you know the Lawrence Lab in Berkeley, uh, Ernst Lawrence was the guy who actually was pretty much father of the atomic bomb. This is his brother. He is the father of the atomic medicine. So nuclear medicine, he is his brother. So he actually saved a lot, a lot of people. Who knows who the guy on the right is? 
<laughs> Everybody. So, that's a quite cool point. So, this is the point of what we're trying to do. More people should know this guy than this guy. This guy saved a lot of people's lives. Like millions of billions. That guy played the guy who killed people. <laughs> and this is what we're trying to do. We try to make stars out of people who help people who do the future and so on. And speaking of stars, our future presenter and uh, the man who leads a worldwide movement, and he's going to talk about it more, Adam Curry. Thank you, everyone. It's good to be back at Stanford when a lecture can draw a couple hundred people on Saturday night. <laughs> So I'll be talking about uh, consciousness and technology. Um, the subtitle of my talk was Tim Pearl Hat and Gage. But given this is a sci-fi event, it probably is appropriate. If you give enough uh, talks or go to enough lectures, you realize that there's kind of an unwritten rule that you have to start your slide presentation with quotes from experts. So I dug up a few for us. From Pierre Pache, physiology professor, quote, Louis Pasteur's theory of germs is ridiculous fiction. Quote, the abdomen, the chest, and the brain will forever be shut from the intrusion of the wise and humane surgeon. Sir John Erickson, my chief British surgeon. And heavier than air flying machines are impossible, said Lord Kelvin, president of the Royal Society. I think this was just a few short years before the uh, Wright brothers took off their plane. So you see where I'm going. Experts are often right, but often they're extremely wrong. This is a talk about consciousness, so what do the experts say about consciousness, or what have they said? Uh, from Francis Crick, who after discovering the helical structure of DNA spent the latter part of his life focused on the question of consciousness, says, you, your joys, your sorrows, your memories, your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. In short, you are nothing but a pack of neurons. So this quote actually represents sort of the dominant mode of thinking about consciousness in the, in the past few decades. Um, and very much to this day, although I think that this perspective is becoming outmoded, and there's a couple of reasons why it's becoming outmoded. I'll talk about two major ones. The first is occurring right now in the philosophy of mind, in the philosophy of mind groups. And it basically says this, if the conventional thinking about consciousness is Francis Crick illustrated is that consciousness, our minds, are nothing more than an illusion produced by the brain. It's actually circular reasoning. Because you need consciousness to experience anything, including an illusion. So the question becomes, an illusion to whom? In neuroscience, you have something called the emergence problem, where for the past few decades, We've done really fantastic neuroscience work with things like MRI. But in that case, in general, what we're looking at are what you might call neurocorrelations. How does what's going on in the brain relate to the first person experiences that we have, our thoughts, our feelings, our intentions, and so forth? And while that work continues, the further we progress down that mode of questioning, the more we are confronted with something that is really the heart of the problem. And that is, why is it that consciousness is attendant to brain function in the first place? Why, if you have a you know, four pounds of chemical and electrical activity signaling back and forth, cannot just, can that not happen without a first person perspective being attended to it? All of, all of the chemical and electrical signaling in the brain can happen without subjectivity. So why is there subjectivity? And that is what we call the hard problem of consciousness, and we have absolutely no idea how to answer it. So uh, many smart people are hip to this fact, including, for example, Christoph Koch, who was Francis Crick's protege, and he, he's now one of the world's leading neuroscientists down at Caltech. And uh, Koch began his career trying to prove the sort of materialist line, materialist perspective of consciousness, but sort of gave up as 
he thought that was a misguided enterprise, and today, in his books and TED Talks, he says this, once you assume that consciousness is real and ontologically distinct, therefore it's different in some way, anyway, from the brain, then it's a simple step to conclude that the entire cosmos is suffused with sentience. We are surrounded and immersed in consciousness. It is in the air we breathe, the soil we tread on, the bacteria that colonize our intestines, and the brain that enables us to think. So Christoph Koch has a perspective that consciousness is a more intrinsic or fundamental aspect of physical reality. So how do we navigate these two perspectives? One, that consciousness is an illusion produced by the brain, and the other, that consciousness somehow extends out into the entire cosmos, and the brain kind of interprets it into a first-person perspective. Well, it turns out that there's a number of people who have been exploring that very question in different ways. I could talk about a couple of them, but the one that comes most quickly to mind is Princeton and our uh, gilded colleagues over on the East Coast. In the 1970s, the fellow here was the dean of the School of Engineering at Princeton and became fascinated with this question of consciousness. Is it all just an illusion of the brain or is it something more? And what he proposed is that if consciousness is just an illusion of the brain, then it shouldn't be able to do anything outside of the brain or outside of the body. But in fact, if it's something more, we should perhaps see physical phenomena that correlate to what's going on in our minds. So he's famous for setting up an experiment using a device called a random number generator. Now what this device is, you might think of it as like a coin flipper, an electronic coin flipper. It produces a series of ones and zeros, and those ones and zeros represent physical phenomena that you can't predict. So for example, the behavior of electron decay, uh, radioactive decay. It goes every which way and you don't know how to predict it, or uh, quantum-based random number generation systems. So it produces a series of ones and zeros that are perfectly random. And <clears throat> what happens is you get this graph in an experiment. I'll explain what that is. The blue line in the middle is what happens when you let the random number generator produce a significant number of ones and zeros. But something happens when you ask a subject to sit in front of the machine and to try to make the device produce more ones. In that case, you get the green line, the green, the green line. If you ask them instead to produce more zeros, to make the machine produce more zeros using only their attention, you get the red line. So this is an experiment that's been done you know, again and again at the Paralab and, and other laboratories, and it leaves us with some pretty confounding data. It suggests that there's some aspect of our minds that can influence the outcome of a random device like a random number generator. So taking this a step further, a couple of research fellows at PEAR created something called the Global Consciousness Project. And I think probably over a couple of years, they asked themselves, well, what would happen if we take these random number generators and we spread them around the world? Will they behave in any interesting ways during mass global events? <clears throat> By show of hands, how many of you have heard of the Global Consciousness Project? Yeah, actually quite a few, about half of you. Okay. So, the Global Consciousness Project has been around for about 20 years, and uh, most famously, they were able to detect a sudden spike in the deviation from chance and the, the degree to which the device has behaved similarly about three hours before the first plane struck the Twin Towers, September 11th. Uh, it's almost like the data is going along here as normal and then suddenly it shoots way upward. You can see at 8.45, the first spike there is when the, uh, the first plane strikes and then 10 o'clock when the buildings fall. And then it declines back down to normal. Now this is a very extreme case but uh, in the course of their database, they've looked at other events that polarize world attention. So things like Princess Diana's funeral, 
or um, sporting events and that kind of thing. And you see similar sort of spikes in these random number generators. It's almost as though the world, or at least what we're measuring with the random number generators, whatever it is, behaves less randomly. There's more coherence in the devices when things happen that cause some sort of polarization of mass attention or emotion on the part of people. So this would be all curious, but not significant if it was just a handful of experiments that have been done. But um, a recent meta-analysis looking at these types of experiments uh, showed that the odds of chance against these experiments, about a thousand published papers um, being just random or, or less than the number of atoms in the known universe. Um, so you're talking like about a thousand peer-reviewed studies on this stuff. The GCP database alone is uh, about one in 1.5 billion odds against chance. The Paralab, uh, 10 to the 12. So there's something going on here when it comes to the interface between consciousness and random physical phenomena. What that something is, we don't know. Um, obviously, a lot of people have their own theories. We kind of have to develop new theories to try to explain this stuff. I'm personally theory agnostic, but I think that it suggests that at some deep level, there's a connection between the substance of our minds and the physical world. Uh, you might think of you might think of an iceberg, where famously, of course, you have the tip of the iceberg above the water, and below you have this deep set of ice. And the conscious mind, on the one hand, might be one iceberg, and below the water level, you have the subconscious mind. You could maybe think of matter as being the same, where at, uh, above the water you have the, the physical world, the material world that you can see, but it could be that there's something like a submaterial realm, what you might think of as the probability realm, or you know, if you will, the quantum realm. And the deeper you go with respect to the mind, and the deeper you go with respect to matter, the more they become indistinguishable, the more they merge toward indistinguishability. That seems to be what these set of experiments are suggesting. So, in looking now at the two perspectives about consciousness, one physically derived and one more non-physical and universal, the weight of this evidence, anyway, seems to suggest that it's probably more in the direction of Christoph Koch's thinking, that consciousness seems more to be a universal kind of thing. That consciousness is a thing and not just an illusion. So this is what's called panpsychism, which is this idea that consciousness is primary, or at least on the same level as matter, and in some sense, they give rise to each other. So when I was a teenager, I was an intern at the, uh, the Paralab in Princeton and found this work fascinating and sort of carried that with me uh, into my career as a technology entrepreneur. But about five years ago, I wanted to do something in this space that combined consciousness research and technology. So I asked myself, what if I could bring together the world's leading consciousness scientists and some significant valley technology talent and get them in the room, what would we come up with? What would that idea be? What would that project be? And I was fortunate that in the, in the course of a couple years of organizing this stuff, I was able to do that. Here's what it looks like. This is called Entangled, and it's a mobile app that will be coming out in a few months. Essentially what Entangled is, it's a, it's a free app that you can download to your phone that turns the hardware, hardware processes inside your phone into a random number generator. And it operates in the background, and your phone will send and record the random numbers and will send it out to a central server. So we'll be able to look for evidence of your mind affecting your phone. So you can see this uh, cute little graph here where you have a user Inside the phone, the way we're doing it is uh, taking the least significant bit off the physical accelerometer and doing some processing to get a nice random bit stream. It goes up to our, our cloud where we can do analysis and conduct experiments and then the user gets some sort of feedback. You might remember the SETI project or the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. They had this um, they had these series of telescopes and they were pointed into space and they were looking for radio signals that seemed to indicate some intelligence behind them. The problem was they didn't have the computers necessary to crunch all of that data 
to see if there's any there there. So what they did is created a little script that a couple million people downloaded to their own computers. And when their computers or home computers were idle, it would do some of the data crunching. And so Entangled to me is, we might call it a SETI project for consciousness. Looking to see what are the parameters of, of our minds. What are the parameters of our individual minds? Can it really affect our phone? When and why and how? And what are the parameters of what you might call collective consciousness or effects that show up in everyone's phone or everyone's data stream around single events? We haven't done the experiment yet, so I don't know if there's going to be any, but this is something for which we're going to test. There's a couple of early graphs on the screen. On the uh, left-hand side, you, when you open the app, you'll get a historical graph of what the random number generator on your phone is doing, some statistics, and then you'll be able to browse a map and see what you might call hotspots, which are, like in the Global Consciousness Project, areas of covariance where your phone, for example, the data on your phone might be behaving like someone else's, which would indicate that you're having some type of effect on the phone at the same time somebody else is. And perhaps, in this case, for example, there's something interesting happening in San Francisco that's causing these spikes to show up on the graph. You'll be able to sort of browse that and get push notifications when cool stuff happens. But digging deeper, this enables us to do science in a way that hasn't really been done before, especially about this type of question. For example, uh, mass meditation is, is getting really popular right now. Meditation in general is getting really popular. And I think we all kind of feel that if enough people get together, sit in a room, or get together in a coordinated way around the world and meditate, that something happens. We have no idea what it is or how it could work, but I think there's this feeling that it has some effect. Well, with a tangle, we can measure it, or we can measure if there is an effect, let's put it that way. So when you download the app, you'll be able to opt in to experiments that we can create on the fly. So one of them is sort of the world's largest mass meditation experiment, and with a, a partner group of ours called Unify, which represents a couple million meditators, um, we'll be able to coordinate such an experiment. So that let's say your phone tells you that at 12 o'clock tomorrow there's a meditation in which a million people will be participating, would you like to do it? You can click yes and opt in on your phone. You'll get a reminder and at 12 o'clock you'll sit down and do the half hour meditation. On our side, we can look at data before, during, and after the meditation to see if there's any effect and if so, what does it look like? So, there's a lot of other fun things you can do. For example, we've got a couple of musicians with whom we'll be working on concerts. Um, I don't know if many of you have been to a concert where uh, you know they're in their second encore and everyone's really all together and having a great time. It's kind of a magical experience. Well, is it more than just a feeling that you're sharing or is there some sort of deeper thing going on? That's something else that we'll be able to measure. In fact, we can even create visual displays that feed back the, if you will, the consciousness data of the crowd in real time into the light display. If indeed, the, as the Global Consciousness Project has suggested, that there's some degree of predictive or presentiment ability in our minds affecting these devices, like with the, the, the graphs on 9-11 shooting up a couple hours before the plane struck, we'll be able to look for the same thing. So I plan on doing an earthquake experiment as well, in which we predefine what an earthquake is in terms of magnitude and location. And if you opt into it, what we'll essentially be doing is borrowing your subconscious mind en masse to see if we can get a spike in the data that uh, happens before some natural disaster. I don't know if it's going to work, but if it does, we might be seeing the beginning of an entirely weird and uh, very unusual way of looking to see if there's any, well, maybe probing for events that might happen in the future if we know a little bit more about what they might be, including earthquakes. So Entangled is a bunch of people um, by this point. Um, Joey Premiani and Ashley, I don't know if they're here from Super Future Labs and Vimeo are a part of it, um, but the Institute of Noetic Sciences has been a partner as well as the Paralab and the Global Consciousness Project. 
um, many other organizations, including uh, Unify and so forth. So Entangled is kind of becoming an aegis under which we're able to all come together and explore these questions using technology. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm sure that, yeah, I know there's a lot of questions. But, yeah, I know, like, compared to our previous talks, I know this is gonna, like, be a lot of questions. So, um, let's line up right here, people who want to do the questions, and we'll start, we'll start, or just line up right here. We'll start slow. Just, just to to tell you, questions should not take longer than one minute. Like, be <laughs> short. So my question is that the Western culture, Western world, started uh, dormant consciousness just recently, and on the in the East, uh, East was totally focused on consciousness for hundreds of thousands of years. And I didn't see anything from the East which you studied in, in your study about consciousness. The East already knows consciousness. They experience it. A lot of enlightened people live in, in the East who live in consciousness, who are consciousness. So why you didn't study any East people? <coughs> I'm a Western guy. <laughs> I'm a product of the 80s too, so that might be why. They already know the answer. They already live in millions of years. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I think that there's, and you're welcome. Um, there, there's a lot of people doing more or less what I'm doing in different ways and have been for a while. And I think that what I've identified is there's this desire to sort of bridge Eastern tradition with. Uh, in Eastern asceticism, sort of Western sensibilities. Um, I think that maybe this is in some small way a part of that. Uh, we talk about science, and when I mean science, I'm talking about Western empirical objectivism. There's a, an entire science of the subjective, which is equally as rich, that goes back thousands of years, um, to which you correctly were. Okay. I saw a slide that was war and terrorism. Can you touch base on what you see as a future project to change the world and make it decent and loving? So on the slide, one of the experiments that I indicated that we might do is a war and terrorism, which is a user could opt in to see if there are effects or spikes in the data or covariance that show up during things like the initiation of wars or terrorist attacks. Um, this is a research experiment, and it's, it's something that I wanted to do because I think it was really cool, and that we can push ahead on learning more about the technology and maybe learning more about what consciousness is and how it works. Um, but I mean, there's definitely a part of me that would hope that whatever we find, if it is indeed positive, like the previous research suggests, uh, that consciousness is not just an illusion, but it is a real thing, and we would see that it's something that is inside all of us, and that unites all of us. And that being in touch with that can maybe help us overcome some of the, the challenges that would otherwise lead to war and terrorism. Uh, that's ambitious, but um, maybe in some small way it can help bring us in that direction. That's kind of a big part of the why behind why we're doing what we're doing. Um, hi. Am I still? Always like this. Okay. <laughs> uh, so it's actually kind of two questions. Um, have you, uh, so have you done any experiments with like meditation on a small scale, uh, Mr. Seth? Uh, so that's one and the second follow-up question. Uh, will the users of that be able to run their own experiments at the one experiment with like different meditation techniques, things like that? At the Pear Lab, there, there were a handful of informal re experiments into whether or not meditators were better at affecting devices than non-meditators. Those results were inconclusive. At, the, at IONS right now, there's a, a series of experiments that show that meditators have profoundly stronger effects on random number generators than non-meditators. 
everyone seems to be able to do it, but people who meditate seem to be able to, for whatever reason, have a stronger effect on the device. Uh, the second question is, will other people be able to do their own experiments? And the answer is yes. Um, maybe not in the initial launch, but definitely on the immediate and the near-term roadmap is the ability for users to coordinate their own experiments. So if you have your own group um, and you want to sort of measure uh, yes. that some event or something that's interesting to you, you can set that up and you can invite your friends onto the platform and, and you can all participate. It makes doing this type of research much easier than normal. Okay, yeah, that'd be cool. I don't know when it's going to be available. Got it. Thanks. What was the name of the other lab? Uh, Paralab? Institute of Noetic Sciences, IONS, yeah, here in, here in the Bay Area, you have a good one. So you keep saying that you will be able to predict all this, and if it, if, if it is a success, if this experiment works, if you get to do the experiment, but when can we expect an experiment happening in one, five, ten years? Where do you see this happening? Well, I have to be careful about saying predict. Um, the best that we can do are correlations of a some statistical significance that fit the predefined parameters going into the experiment. Um, and even then, it's not necessarily predictions, but it's it seems to maybe herald or be correlated to it in advance. Um, when you talk about predictions, you're getting into political territory and a lot of, a lot of dangerous stuff, especially for something like earthquakes or terrorism. Um, we are getting underway with the development now. We're, we're like about two months behind, but from the outset, from the first release, we should be able to allow people to opt into the experiments. And then, you know, I would definitely expect them this year in 2016. The results, anyway, of a mass experiment, probably a meditation experiment this year. Um, so I have no doubt you're going to find a lot of data that, that validates that it's possible to um, measure this. But I'm wondering, if you go back to your initial example with the people coming in the room that are uh, influenced, <coughs> the, the outcome that's influenced, if you measure this over an ash scale, what, um, what, what measures are you putting in place so that the data isn't just reflecting that? Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, that's, Sorry, that's, might a, explain it that's a really good question. And uh, permit me to prattle on a bit. Okay while I answer or not answer it. Um, <clears throat> if we had an REG in this room, and it's, say, responding to what's going on in this room, it's probably because we've set an expectation for it to respond, not because there is some sort of field that is broadcast from all of our skulls uh, that's affecting the device. In other words, there could be another group on the other side of this wall, and they will not have an influence on the random number generator. They don't even know that it's there or that any of this is going on. So now what are we dealing with? Well, we're dealing with a kind of force that's very different than what we're used to thinking about in terms of forces. When you think force, you think, oh, okay, well, like electromagnetic waves or something that ripple out and fall off in magnitude by the square of the distance between the devices. This is not how consciousness seems to behave. Consciousness seems to behave more like an information field than a physical field. And information has certain properties unlike physical things. Uh, it doesn't fall off by the square of the distance, and it seems to be capable of being directed somehow. So if you have, say, a couple million people who have downloaded Entangled, and only 100,000 who opt in to a meditation experiment, it's like they've set an intention that their minds or some part of their minds, their subconscious mind, will affect the device, or not affect the device, but they've, if you will, entangled themselves into that experiment, which is just a metaphor, I'm not suggesting that's how it works. Um, and then on the server side, when it comes to experiments, we'll be able to parse out those who opted in and look at their data before, during, and after, seeing if it behaved the way that it should statistically, so uh, more or less an even number of ones to zeros, or if it showed sort of spikes, more ones, more zeros, and how that might have behaved similar to other people who were in the experiment. We can then compare that to 
theoretical chance what they should have got if there was no influence due to consciousness or something else, or and or the data produced by people who did not opt into the experiment. So that's kind of how we're getting around that problem. But it's a tricksy one, and it's a very erudite question. I was wondering how you would distinguish the signals from, say, a natural disaster from a counselor account or a mass uh, medication. And my second question is, um, how are you addressing the privacy concerns for using signals? So for the first question, I think the, what, I, what I just uh, talked about generally is the way that we go about separating signals. So uh, you're, you're really looking at people who's, who have directed their minds maybe at a subconscious level to affect the devices. And so maybe they're not at the concert, and they're not going to have an effect on the, the network. But they, they might, but we'll be able to sort of to, to see if that's true or not by looking at who opted into various experiments. Uh, on the privacy side, that is that is a, a concern. Um, you know, the data that we can collect is anonymized. Uh, you can opt into, or you can create an account that might have like a username and email address, but the way that we'll be able to look at it will be anonymized. And there's nothing that anyone could really learn from the data or use the data uh, to do other than the very questions that we're being very transparent about asking. If that answers your question. Okay, my question is, um, uh, does technology or your technology can prove about the law of attraction? You know, like kind of theory or about uh, maybe you pray and then you probably the God will answer you and my friend say probably you can pray and then when you see it's kind of like your conscious kind of upload and if you know how to pray and then you can know how to download and or if you feel like you're in low energy sometimes not about your maybe lack of oxygen maybe it's because you lack of chi we call it chi because by like energy and you can go to a certain place to get that chi back. And I don't know if technology can prove that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the easy questions. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if technology can prove that either. I, I think so. I don't know if this is the experiment or the, the technology that can prove it. Um, maybe it might push us in that direction if indeed there's something there. Uh, <clears throat> So you asked if the, the phenomena is related to what, what people might call in the macroscopic world, like uh, the law of attraction, uh, which is kind of this idea, more or less, that you can create your own reality. I think that's very dangerous territory. Um, while I'm sympathetic to the idea that why we might influence our own reality, you tell that to somebody with chronic pain. Right? Um, however, if there is if we can influence, like, or to some extent signal people around us or cause a cascade of events that is consistent with our intentions, then what we're looking at with the influence of mind on random number generator might be some piece of that mechanism. Maybe a better way to put it would be that the random number generator experiments suggest that we need to think differently about what consciousness is. If it's some thing that is fundamental and spread throughout the universe, and we're kind of a uh, sort of a we're decoding it, right? The brain or the nervous system is like decoding it in some way. Uh, then it could be that there's completely explainable mechanisms between human beings and other human beings that a set in place would conspire to bring, for example, the business contact, whatever it is that you were using the law of attraction to, to bring you. That's hugely speculative on my part, but I think it's uh, it's a fair question now that we're kind of in the mainstream way broadening our, our perspective about what consciousness is and our place in the universe. Don't you believe in it? The law of attraction? You can set your intention and then it will come to you. I've certainly had some crazy experiences, personal experiences doing that. <laughs> <laughs> in, a, in a big way, a lot of this came through you know what you might call synchronicity, like a lot of meeting the right people. My teammates are here in the back. If you have questions, feel free to ask them there. Joey Pugliani and Ashley in the back. Yeah. We have two more questions. That's it. I'm going to ask you to speculate a little bit. Uh, there seemed to be some sort of um, 
idea that you're suggesting that there's some interesting relationship between the consciousness and time. Um, you're suggesting some sort of precognition of the collectiveness. And I just wanted to dig further into your opinion or on, on this temporal association. Yeah, uh, it, as, as though mind matter interaction were hard enough, now you have time travel. Um, as I was saying before, a correct way to think about the mechanism might be that consciousness is more of an information mechanism than a physical mechanism. Information doesn't necessarily obey the same temporal laws as sort of physical fields do. And so if what I'm suggesting by way of metaphor is, is correct, then consciousness might be some kind of free agent temporally. We know, for example, that um, in quantum mechanics, you can have something called retrocausation, which is where you prepare two particles, and you send one off at light speed in one direction, and you send one off at light speed down hundreds of miles of fiber optic cable, so it has longer to travel. And then you measure the first one, you measure the, the later one in a certain way that it causes a backwards going effect in time, more or less, on the entangled particle. So we, we know that there's a thing called retrocausation, which you can have these delays in time. Whether or not that's what's going on here, I mean, I don't really know. Uh, I know that the Pear Lab and other labs have done experiments in which they will collect a body of random number generator data, not look at it, and then a week later, ask somebody to try to affect the collection of data in the past, and they see the same signatures. They've also done the same kind of thing in reverse, in which, let's say it's a Tuesday, and I ask you, okay, in a week we're gonna do an experiment. I want you to set your intention or try to affect the machine right now. You'll do it, and then you know, a week will, will transpire, and they'll go, oh, we gotta record that data, and so they'll record it, look at it, and show effects that are consistent with what you pre-stated your desire was. So there's some empirical evidence to suggest that even though we can't explain what the hell's going on, it, it nonetheless seems to be a, a bizarre feature of where your consciousness can interject into, uh, into a physical system. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I was particularly drawn to your slide regarding 9-11 and the Global Consciousness Project. Um, and I was wondering to what extent, uh, over the length of the project, were they able to duplicate those findings and the results? Um, I'm basically asking, was that a false positive? Yeah, good question. Um, if you looked at the, if you looked at the data on that day, the odds against chance are very low that that was a false positive. However. If you're collecting data and comparing events over the course of a couple decades, chances are you're going to get some false positives. Random data being what it is, occasionally you get these crazy spikes and maybe something just so uh, happened to occur on that day. Um, you know, it turns out that you can, if you pre-state the experiments in the right way, you can do the right stats to look to see if, if that was a false positive or not. But the deeper question I think you're asking is, if, as, as we're suggesting, our minds might be able to affect things outside of our bodies, like maybe random things or the outcomes of experiments, what does that mean for replicability in science in general? <laughs> and you know what's really funny is every scientific discipline is facing a challenge right now called um, reversion to the mean, or in other words, the decline effect. Uh, maybe some of you have experienced this yourself, where you'll think of an idea, and you'll test it, and you'll get amazing results, and you'll do it again, and you'll get pretty good results, and then the third time or whatever, you'll get nothing. So this is something that obviously, as scientists, we're not really keen on reporting too much, but there might be something even deeper going on related to a new kind of experimenter effect having to do with the desire for their outcomes to you know, be in the direction of their intention, but it doesn't hold. So uh, replicability is an issue in this science, and it's one that has, it's probably one of the reasons why many of you are just hearing about this for the first time, 
even though the experiments were initiated many decades ago. Because if one lab does it, then oh, you should be able to like go get an NIH grant and uh, sit in front of a team of skeptics in a cinder block basement and reproduce it again and again and again. But it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way, in my opinion, because human beings are, we're not engineering variables. We might have good days, we might have bad days. The degree to which I think that you disapprove of me even being a part of this experiment might affect the outcomes, or that I get the vibe or whatever that you're wanting me to fail, or that maybe internally I don't want the experiment to be a success, or internally I do, can have an effect on the outcome of the experiment. That makes replicability in this way that we've approached it um, in science up to this point very difficult. Okay, I, that, that was the last question, but you will be able to come and talk to Adam after we finish. Okay, so you, now I have a question, but you mentioned, <laughs> uh, you mentioned you have some experiments or demos for the people. Do you want to do it now to everybody, or you want to people just randomly come to you afterwards and do it? I've actually never been able to really do this as a group, so I think it'd be fun. Um, so what I have here is a physical random number generator that's uh, measuring electron charge, which is a quantum effect. And we've connected it to a couple of LEDs. And I, I put a, an Ikea, Ikea Fado glow over it. <clears throat> so when I plug it in, it's going to glow white. And it's going to stay white. And the white means that the random number generator statistically is behaving the way that, it, that we would expect. If there is a spike in the output of the random number generator, it will trigger a secondary function that will again at random pick one of eight colors and turn that color. So um, can I get a volunteer from the audience? And you don't have to get up, we'll put it on the table. I know everybody's trying to see the ball. Okay, you don't, you don't have to stand up, but um, how about this? Why don't you think of a color? Okay, tell us what it was. Red. Okay. Okay, so everyone, we're going to try to make this Fado turn from white to red. You don't have to stand up or put it here. Don't worry about it. If we put it on the table, you can see, cannot see it, then we have to stand up. Now can anybody? Okay, now you have to stand up. Okay. <laughs> Everybody can see the globe from order. Whoever cannot see it, you can stand up. Oh. Yeah, guys, feel free to come. Like, come to the first row. <laughs> yeah. I was not a musician. Not, not a magician. <laughs> So you're gonna try to make see what color the glow is turning to. Try this one. By thinking about the color. Um, this course is very short, so I don't think it's going to work. Thanks. 
Can you not hold it? You're going to influence it. Don't do it. <laughs> okay. Adam, what do we need to do now? Everybody think red. Everybody think red. Think red. I need to get up. <laughs> Bottom turning to something. How long does it usually like, usually work that way? Just by chance, it should turn a color once every eight minutes. <laughs> Wait, we should meditate. Yes, exactly. Okay. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, people go red, red. It's about green and red. Keep up. No. Who's picking green? I'll pick up two colors. It's green. And now it's green. <laughs> Now it's red. Is it red? Orange. Orange. <laughs> British to me. <laughs> <laughs>
So you guys can try it individually or as groups, just sort of come up to it and uh, turn it a color. And don't touch the ball. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Okay, good. We have another demo circle. Here we go. <laughs> okay, so first of all, let's give big Russian. round of applause to Adam. Question. And now, wait, 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 stop going, stop going for a second. Now the important part of what we're trying to do is that people need to socialize. You need to talk about what Adam said, with me about maybe about some other project which we had, um, like traveling to the future, invisible clock, which we had, and so on. So try to come up to the person you don't know and try to talk about it, because that's where the interesting conversation starts. And you can also come to Adam and any questions which you didn't ask and talk to them. Thank you very much, and now we have socializing. Thank you, guys. Okay, guys, I'm gonna go. Hi. Hello. Hey, Sergi. See you later, guys.